Um, this is um, a, I've been told I've only got 15 minutes, so I'm going to kind of do whistle stop tour of this. The, and there's a lot that I'm not going to talk about. It's called Goldsmith Street in Norwich. Um, and here we go. So there's lots of stuff I'm not going to talk about, um, but I'm going to talk about mostly the kind of initial design stages and how kind of Passive House influenced the design. Because uh, that's really the kind of the big, where the big hitters come into the project. Um, so, oh, before we go into that, just to say what our role was, um, we worked as um, Passive House consultants on the project and we also um, did the mechanical services design for this. Um, we're based um, about six hours away from the site as well. So this was, and it's 105 dwellings. So it was a really big thing for us to take this on, to be confident that we could do a good job of it. Um, but the client was just so committed to doing something really well that we were kind of we couldn't turn it down really so there's some really key parts of this project which are not related to passive house at all but uh, ultimately kind of really bring uh, turn it into something that's very special and the most important one of these is the spaces between the streets and um, they're very long terraces and they've created really beautiful spaces that really um, uh, make sure that there's engagement between the occupants and that there is all the stuff that we are starting to experience now with that having cars um, flying around everywhere um, so a lot of that has kind of gone into the design so that's a really key thing they also were slightly bigger than uh, kind of standard UK homes but the main thing was kind of this external layout stuff and here's another view showing um, typical again kind of really great use of external space between the um, the buildings and um, we've got a range across the site of um, houses um, about 50% of them, so we've got about 50 houses on the site and we've got about 50 flats which are in these uh, kind of bookend bits or I don't know what you call those architecturally. So that, that's kind of where we sit. And looking from the air, this is what it looks like. You can see here the, um, the long terraces, uh, the flats at the end of each one. And uh, what was really great from our perspective was that the layout of the site meant that we could um, orientate the terraces um, to the south and to the north. And we'll talk about why that's so important to start um, further down the line. Now, when we got involved, there were already had been some work done on the design and the architects had really got hold of this concept of solar design and trying to maximize the solar um, uh, gain from across this site and they had set out the spaces between the, um, the terraces. They didn't have as long terraces as we showed now but the spaces between them were really kind of quite nice spaces. So we had the street, garden and street spaces between the two. Um, and this was kind of a great starting point from our perspective. We weren't so keen on the massive amounts of solar gain, but in terms of the kind of streetscape, that seemed to work really well for us. Um, there's a load of stuff that goes into the design uh, and kind of influences um, from a passive house perspective. But I'm going to pick the two real big hitters. So I'm going to talk about form and complexity and orientation and glazing. So it's kicking off. This was the original scheme. So terraces, definitely a thumbs up from us in terms of passive house makes life an awful lot easier. Um, and a lot of repetition there already, which was a great starter. So that was what was good about the scheme. There were some things which weren't really ideal. And the first of these was the depth from front to back of the building. And because this was, they were narrow, it meant that the heat loss area that we had was relatively high. Um, and comparing that to another project that we were looking at, um, which we'd just completed, Raynham, um, the difference was um, 1.5 kilowatt hours per meter squared per hour and now a year. Now I meant to turn this into something which is kind of meaningful for you, but that's kind of a tenth of the heat loss of our kind of our heat loss budget. Um, so there was a lot of angst about exactly what depth was okay front to back. Um, and we ended up with something that, that was slightly better than was originally proposed, but at the same time, we didn't want to push it to something that felt uncomfortable as well, because it obviously has impacts for the layout and for the site wide stuff as well. Um, and in a similar way, uh, one of the other things which wasn't quite ideal was um, the insulation line goes up the pitch of the roof. 
And because of that, we have more heat loss area than if the insulation went across the ceiling. Um, so that was kind of something which wasn't um, wasn't the best, but it was kind of we could suck it, suck it up. There were a lot of other things um, which we made really significant headway in and particularly um, trying to um, reduce the level of complexity across the site. And here's just a couple of examples of the kind of things that we did. So, for example, here where this is the flats, the entrance, and you can see we've got an inset door. Now, this is really difficult to do a good job of. And so we talked through this design and what we ended up doing was um, changing this so that the doorway is in line with the insulation behind the wall. And then we kind of created this um, porchy bit over the top, which everyone felt was like a much better solution and was much easier to build and just kind of better all round. Um, we also had these kind of pop-up roof bits, which were really complicated. And uh, through a lot of um, back and forth with us and the rest of the team, we decided that we could get rid of half of them. Um, by making the building slightly wider and therefore kind of fitting in bedrooms and other places. Um, and there were also some bits like some pretty crazy dormer bits that we were stuck on and we managed to get rid of those too, um, which meant that we ended up with some much simpler and much more beautiful and easier to build kind of details in terms of the roof structure there on the, um, on the, the flats. So the complexity thing was kind of something which we were really pushing through all the way but particularly at the beginning so this is the a section through the housing and you can see it's kind of relatively simple in comparison the houses where they have the pop-ups we have um, four extra junctions in section like that and if you take a section the other way um, there is an additional four there so just lots of extra bits to think about which is not really ideal um, and there they are. There's what the, the kind of pop ups ended up. So the fact that we managed to get them reduced down to um, I think it's four in the end um, made a really big difference. So four across the whole scheme. So here is the site in plan. Um, and just coming back to this idea about kind of the level of repetition versus um, kind of um, variance, uh, we can see here that these are the two story houses, which are pretty much all identical. There's very little difference between type A and type D. Um, and here we have the three story ones with that pop up that was kind of a bit more complicated. So we've only got four of those across the site. So those, from our perspective, this was kind of a really massive success. You know, a lot of repetition here, really easy for us to manage, lots of opportunity for optimization. Then when we get onto the flats, we, there's just so many different variants across the site that it really felt like a lot of firefighting to try and keep on top of the design. Um, so, and this makes, as sites get much more bigger, as sites get bigger, this becomes much more critical um, to kind of keep it simple so that you can keep it all in your head to start with, but also the opportunity to kind of optimize and everything else. So on this particular site, um, with 50 flats, 50 homes, we reckon both for the building services design and for the kind of passive house consultancy, about 70% of our time was spent on the flats. Um, and that felt like a real shame that that opportunity to do the same thing um, and particularly to kind of really make details incredibly beautiful just was kind of limited. Um, so that meant that the houses, um, everything was kind of finely tuned and really well thought through. And then when it came to the flats, it just it, there was a lot of firefighting and it, they look fine and and everything works but they were really tricky to build they were just a lot harder work all round so um i know this i don't know whether this is i kind of i think that you guys use the form factor as well as a kind of in which is an indication of how efficient a building form is um so this is definitely one for the geeks um this is uh, the form factor is the heat loss area divided by the floor area so this means the lower the number the better um, it means less insulation and typically for the UK we have um, if we have a form factor of 2.4 that means we need 10 inches of insulation um, and if we have a form factor of 3 it means we need 12 inches of insulation so we kind of really definitely want to be down this end of things 
and this is where Goldsmith Street is. Um, so that's each one of the terraces shown there. And this meant that it was actually quite hard to manage because we had this variation across the site. So trying to find strategies for these large projects where you can vary a few simple things and everything else is the same is really important. In the end for Goldsmith Street, we just ended up going for and kind of oversized timber frames so that we were certain that everything was passing. The other big thing, orientation and glazing. As I said, like this, um, the site meant that we could very easily orientate um, these very long terraces um, facing south and north. And I mean, this just made me so incredibly happy. This emoji does not do it justice how kind of happy I was. And the reason for that is um, the impact uh, for the UK on uh, summertime comfort. So here we have a graph to kind of try and explain this. Um, if we have, um, I'm just interested really in the summertime because actually the winter time, you can see that the solar gains don't really vary an awful lot depending on orientation. They do a bit, but no, no big deal, kind of, it doesn't really matter. This is for a house where the amount of glazing on the front and the back is exactly the same. So it's kind of, it's got, or it's got glazing because it's a terrace it's got glazing on both aspects and it's kind of being moved around in comparison when we look at the summertime and we have a building which is facing north and south in comparison the same building with the same glazing facing east and west is significantly higher solar gains so that means in terms of keeping buildings comfortable in the summertime orientation is key and if you have buildings which are facing east and west you just have to work an awful lot harder so because this was social housing and we didn't know who was going to be moving into it um, summer comfort was kind of really high on the priorities so the orientation we were like big tick amazing then we started talking to the architects about glazing and this was their first sketch that they sent through to us and as i said before they were kind of completely obsessed with the idea of um, capturing as much solar gain as they possibly could ah! um, so we had to have some quiet words about that and kind of basically say that the amount of glass that they were proposing putting on here just really wasn't appropriate at all um, for um, you know small any housing really um, and here's the heat loss, uh, uh, the breakdown of it. And you can see it's, the windows are absolutely dominating the heat loss as well. So this would have been, if they'd have built it like this, it would be incredibly com uncomfortable in the summertime and the winter time. So we had a kind of, um, we had lots of back and forth between us and the team to try and work out what we felt okay about in terms of the glazing. And about halfway through, we ended up with something that looked like this. Now these two are bedrooms up here and personally I'm not that keen on seeing anything below the waistline in my bedroom. So um, the uh, and also this still was from our perspective massively overglazed and we were really worried about the the, com the summer comfort. So we went back and we did some calculations looking at the daylight levels within there and we kind of said well something like this is probably more appropriate. This is going to give you the right level of daylighting and everything else and they said oh well yeah that's that's okay we could deal with that but actually what we really want is this. And so we said, mm, okay, well, we can do that, but you have to have this shading thing instead, if you want that, that's the deal. And they said, okay, yeah, that's where we can go from. So the shading here is to deal with the fact that the windows are slightly larger than they should be. And the north elevation there, just to show you. And in a similar way, we went through the kind of windows on the flats by first of all saying, you just need to get rid of a whole lot of it. There was loads of back and forth between us about trying to work out what the glazing should be doing, what we needed from it. And this is where we ended up. And you can see in comparison to that original sketch, you know, it's it, the, the glazing is really quite minimal. And I think this is the real success of um, uh, the project is, then they had this idea about how they thought it was going to look and they were very able to kind of pull away from that and go for something else. So that's a, um, I think um, it shows a real skill. Uh, and then we have a kind of the flats. And one of the other things that I think is really lovely about these kind of porchy things is the little set in um, letterbox there. Right. 
so that's it i've got no idea how long i did oh 17 minutes or slightly more um i'm also talking about another one of our projects on the 25th of june this is a plug for um uh, agar grove which uh, if anyone's interested then it'll be up on the sibsi website